my point really is that we often are designating <coughs> these dictated, dictated thank you, by what resources we have and what we know. So my career counselor didn't look to me what I wanted to do and what I was interested in. Or wasn't sure if I could, is it possible? So now let's go to the stories here in Minnesota. A lot of the students in high school who with significant disabilities are typically and unfortunately pipeline to a DTNH day training and habilitation. DTNH program or sheltered workshop they could be called. And that seems to be a logical resource option and it's a huge business out there. A lot of private companies, providers that provide that type of service. And that's how it's been all along. Well, there's a reason for that. And as I give you a little bit of a history about that, so hold that box. Let me go back. Back in the old days, in the 70s, a lot of people with disabilities were institutionalized. They thought that was the best place for them. That's the best place for them to go. So they lived there. They stayed there. Until it was a time that we needed to reform and close down those institutions in the 70s and send them out in the community. So two programs were established after that. This DTNH I'm speaking of and corporate foster care was the other option, group home. Now the concept then, it was great at that time because they were out in the community. However, as time went along, they were still you know, pretty much segregated, still secluded in the work, shelter workshop environment as well as in the group home. But today we say don't, that's not acceptable. We need to allow other people to have opportunities to become more integrated in the community and not rely on the business models that are out there. Follow me so far? Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm excited about WIOA because one part of the requirement says that before we pipeline some of the students into this ETH, they have to have an opportunity to sit down with a counselor, a VR counselor, excuse me, to decide is this the right place for them or not? Some DTHs are appropriate places, sure, for some people, but not everyone. So, and for some of us, new folks coming into the field, you know, you don't have the history possibly, hopefully then you'll be able to see the person as a whole and see what they're able to do. You know, and stretch the boundaries a little bit with the appropriate resources and support to let them experience jobs out in the community if that's what they want, of course. So, education is another example. Become more inclusive. Housing services. Individuals have um, the right to choose where they want to live. And with whom? Transportation. Healthcare. Transition services. Now, transition services is not um, your typical definition from school to work, transition services. No, transition services really mean from one segregated setting to a, another more integrated setting, which means if the person really wants to make that move, they need the appropriate support to make sure they're successful. They can say, okay, you've been living in this group home, you know, with three other people, and then, oh, they decided, you know, what you're gonna do for any entertainment or enjoyment, and they have a schedule when you can and can't eat, and then during the day, you're gonna go live in an apartment all of a sudden, well, Chances are maybe that's not going to be very successful, just moving out to an apartment. So those are the transition supports that we're talking about. Two new included topic areas are very, very important. Preventing abuse and neglect was one. We have had just tremendous 
terrible high numbers of abuse situations here in Minnesota, and unfortunately, they're not reported. And we recognize there's a huge problem out there. Some are afraid. They're afraid of retaliation if they report from their providers. A lot of providers maybe aren't trained adequately, you know, aren't paid very well either, you know, and they're just making do. So one of the huge challenges that we have here in the state of Minnesota is PCA services, personal care attendants. There's just not enough people out there to you know, have other people ready to work for them. And they, have, they don't have adequate mm, training to deal with specific or unique cases. <clears throat> another, is, another new topic is assistive technology. That's a huge benefit we're seeing of technology out there to help with independence for individuals. And the last area is community engagement. We feel that's critical, critical key. We must operate with the mindset that people with disabilities become more integrated in employment, housing. We have to expect them to be involved in their community, various community events, activities, interests that they have out there as well. Unfortunately now, some of fiends, you know, of the waiver dollars, <coughs> waiver dollars or yes, or uh, assistance dollars have really some restrictions on that, so we need to think how think about how we can have provide more opportunities. <clears throat> so those are the two, excuse me, those are our 13 different topic areas. Now, and each topic area has its own goals and strategies and work plans within. Now the OMSET plan that we have currently, it means one and done, it's the final document, that is not the case. The concept behind this document will be a fluid firm with goals, yes. We can add, but we can't take away. But we can be fluid with our work plan to make sure that we actually get any those increased number of opportunities. Maybe I should talk a little bit about my office and what I do. Right now I have three staff. We just hired our fourth person and we will all be hiring our fifth person shortly. I'm very excited. We have such a small team. Which means that we actually have to work to collaborate with collaborate with all the state agencies and using their resources as well. It is a kind of unique environment. We are working, like I said, very closely with multiple teams out there. If you think about those 39 goals that I was speaking of, they could easily multiply you know, by two or three times the number of teams that we're working with to make sure that they are accountable to the goal. We have a compliance office within our group that monitors the progress of their work. My office also works very closely with um, a dispute resolution opportunity. Sometimes, you know, a person with disabilities um, gets frustrated, you know, and they're not able to navigate the system. So, and what, how they want to express themselves or their concerns. And they don't know where to go, who to contact. Um, imagine myself trying to call through a video phone and trying to use their automated system, you know, to get the wrong person back and forth, it gets quite frustrating. So probably that's why many individuals with disabilities are feeling the same. They just take whatever they get and tolerate what they have. Really, we're trying to change the thinking and create more opportunities for them to voice their concerns. So they have an opportunity then to call our office. We listen to them. We try to connect them with the correct person to resolve their issue. Now, it's kind of cool right now because they're teaching us what kinds of experiences that they're having navigating the system. It can, it varies, you know. Basically, I'll tell you, the problem really is people don't listen. They really don't know how to listen. You know, that's 
really one of the problems that we've been trying to work through. Really encouraging, encouraging you to develop some good engagement skills with individuals. Listening, talking, trying to be in their shoes and understand what it's like to have a disability 24 seven and navigating the system that's not always very easy. We do a, a quality of life survey as well, that's part of our office. And the communication, uh, talk about that. I have some paperwork if you're interested to sign up to be on our email list to get a newsletter so you know what's going on with our homestead plan and how it might impact you for the future. Maybe at your internship opportunities or other working opportunities because in your field, it is guaranteed that Olmstead will become part of it. Olmstead itself, the decision, and ADA really are two pieces of mm, the legal leverage that you have in your back pocket when you're advocating for a person with disabilities. It says they have the right to be integrated the best possible way that fits their needs. Okay. I didn't really give you a quick overview of uh, our plan, but there are another thing I would like to share with you as well. If you notice this other document here, um, one page here, it's a public um, input for the Olmstead plan. Now, if you have family members, or you have any friends, colleagues that are interested in the plan, we really want your input about the plan itself. So you have an opportunity to give us your thoughts, suggestions. You know, are there some challenges that are preventing us from getting to what we need, where we need to be? Are there some opportunities we are unaware of? You have an opportunity to give us some email, calls, whatever. Also, we will have um, listening sessions shortly too. And we plan to, as you look at the back of it, we have three different sessions. One, I'll be back here again next week. We'll have a focus group. And try and encourage people to come to that and give us some input on that as well. And this other document I have here, it says our measurable goals. It's our entire plan right here in, at a glance, excuse me, entire plan at a glance, our measurable goals. Is this yours? No, this is yours. Oh, I'm going to pause for a minute, so I want to see <coughs> questions. Anything you're curious about, wants, wants to know more about specific areas or anything? Yes? If I can go off topic, if that's okay. Um, sure. We haven't had too many people come in and talk to us as a person with a disability, such as yourself. Sure. And I think it would be really great to hear your advice, your experiences, what you can tell us as future uh, rehab counselors. What tips, what things have worked well? Like you started that with a little bit of your story, just in general, if you had anything. Thank you. Um, one challenge is. Um, that I have as a person with a disability. I'm deaf, you know, I'm in the deaf community. You know, we don't look up as ourselves as we have a disability, but because I was born and raised in a deaf family. So I'm very normal. I feel very normal. However, when I'm out in the public, the world, I feel like I have a disability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me give you um, some of my input on that. In my work environment, the system and their work areas a lot of work is being changed to become more inclusive. And one way that you can be more inclusive is to really analyze your own biases. You hear a lot about unconscious bias or the implicit bias, the things that we grew up with, and actually there is a really good tool online called implicitbias.com. I think it's a test. Um, and pick the disability one. 
Now, it's an actual tool where you look and you see different photos, different types of photos, they come up on the screen, and you have to click on your computer. At the end of that test, that tells you what your tendencies are. Do you lead, lead towards one way or another? Now understand, I have a silly. I grew up in the deaf community. I work with people with disabilities. I'm around people with disabilities. Still, and the computer tells me that I have a, a little bit of tendency towards able-bodied people. I thought, whoa, <laughs> that was an eye-opening experience for me because that is something that just, just starts from day one and it just gets attached to you. And what's important is that you need to be aware of that and constantly check in with yourself. Um, I have a really good example. I was recently in a meeting just a couple weeks ago, and um, the whole group are able-bodied persons. Everybody can hear. And we were talking, and I was putting in my two cents. And of course, sometimes you have you know someone who might be a little paternalistic or want to correct me or who want to repeat what I might say but and give more of an oomph emphasis to it. I'm like, well, okay, no big deal. But, um, but one person had recognized that and had then emailed me and said, oh, you know, I really recognize that. I, I made it look like I was taking your voice away. And I really appreciated that. And that's where you need to figure out how to become an ally. So really take the time to learn what behaviors, well, ally is it's a verb, first of all, it's a verb. So thinking about your actions, your thoughts, and your constant check-in with yourself. <coughs> Am I actually being an ableist in my behavior, in, in my words, in my thoughts, in my actions? It, it comes up, it will. It'll come up, and it's okay. I think people are afraid to admit it, that we have some of those biases. But it's what you do with it, and how you continue to make changes to learn from it. You know, again, my life growing up, the expectations were always low. Until this day, you know, when People, you know, find out that I have a PhD, for example, they're like, you have a PhD? Oh. And they're not really <coughs> sure about that. You know, they choose not to call me doctor. Mm -hmm. Because they're really not sure if they heard that correctly. So, and that's their, their self biases that they have. So that's one example. Um, as a deaf person in a world, auditory world, we go through a lot of challenges and barriers. We really encourage people to recognize that people are individual and every individual is different. Every individual has their own journey. So that's important. I don't know if that helps a little bit, but please, I'm open if you have any questions, anything else you're curious about. Yes. If I don't want to be in the cities, but I am interested in like the legislative part, is there any areas like that in the northern areas? Oh, oh, I'm sure. I'm trying to think how to respond to your question. Um, there's always work with policy, you know, to make the impact for change. Also, the opportunity to impact your legislator in the area is tremendous. It creates more value and more meaning for them to, when they come to the Twin Cities to fight and support for resources. Oftentimes, people who live in greater Minnesota are very frustrated. They're feeling they're neglected. They feel they're left out. And they're always the last to receive, I guess, how do you say, resource supports from the state and the metro area. So I think it's very valuable to look at what kind of contribution you want to make. If you're interested in policy work, 
or working with the legislator, you know, get to know.